because I know that these times usually they, uh, the questions increase, so we many times don't end up finishing them all. So um, the first question says, is having tattoos a sin if the reason is destroying the body of Christ? Wouldn't haircuts, junk food, piercing, uh, piercing ear also be considered destroying the body of Christ? Yes, part of it is because destroying the body of Christ. Um, and yes, I agree with you that eating junk food, but we're not talking about whether it's a sin or not. What I would disagree is that we don't have to label something as a sin for it to not be appropriate for a Christian to do. Our forefathers, they had to tattoo the cross on their hand. This was for a period of time. This does not need to be done anymore. And there's many bishops and righteous holy people that have, uh, including His Holiness Pope Shinoda III, that would say this is no longer necessary for it to be done. Um, so even this simple, like, cross plus sign uh, uh, type of a cross um, is, is unnecessary in our modern time. And yes, it is because there's no need for us to do it. We don't, but we don't, uh, we prefer not to ask the question, is it a sin or not? Just because something's not a sin does not mean it's appropriate for me as a Christian to do. I look for what is the best thing for me to be doing, not just for what is permissible for me to be doing. One of the saints, St. Dorotheos of Gaza, says, if I do everything permissible for me, and that's the, my measuring stick, then I will end up doing the things that are not permissible for me. If I'm doing everything permissible, if I'm looking for anything permissible, then I will end up doing the things that are um, impermissible. Uh, what's the church's opinion on things like birth control uh, pills and condoms? They're fine, as long as the birth control uh, pill is not something like the morning after pill, um, what is commonly called the morning after pill, that, that it kill, kills the conceived um, um, embryo. Uh, sorry, uh, embryo? Yeah, yeah embryo. Uh, what's the church's opinions on tampons? Does it truly remove a girl's virginity? No, it does not. Um, it's very acceptable. It's very normal. It's very good. Um, plus, I don't know the order to the question. How do we bring an atheist friend? How do we bring an atheist friend from, or one from another religion, to our church? How do we approach this? First and foremost, be an icon of Christ. Instead of you trying to convince them that what they are doing is wrong, if you are living out your life of repentance and if you are becoming more and more an icon of Christ, then they will see Christ in you and desire what is in you. So instead of going out there trying to arm wrestle and debate people and prove to them that they're right or they're wrong, when they see the love of Christ in you, they will desire to have what you have. So more and more, instead of us trying to figure out how we can rebuttal, how it is that we can memorize very specific arguments for the sake of being able to convince people strictly at the level of the rationale or the reason, it is extremely more important for you to be a loving servant to that person, a person that they can see Christ in. And if they see Christ reflected in you, then they will desire to come and join you where you have received that very thing that they love about you. So this idea of incarnational evangelism and evangelism that is seen and perceived in you is significantly more important then you're just trying to convince someone that they should come to the church that you attend. So my question here is like how to live a Christian life is all our responsibilities in life, such as work and marriage. So to live a Christian life, it's easy to be an image of Christ. For example, like if even I'm, I'm at work or at school or anywhere, what Jesus said and how to live. For example, like I have to lie. So lie? No. The very important thing that I have to live, I have to be an image of Christ. Read the Bible, read the, read the gospel. Read what Jesus said. Read the scripture. And how to live, I have to remember as Sayyidina said, what about Jesus Christ's prayer? I have to do all the way. One thing I remember that I, I learned from an elder from uh, the monastery in Egypt. He said, thank God every single hour. In the beginning, for, for example, I have to, to thank him every hour. If I have, for example, like psalm, I love a psalm, some psalm, for example. So I have to, to read a psalm during the day. So to live during the, my marriage, I have to be a symbol of Christ also for my wife and my kids. I have to, to pray. I have to teach them how to pray. I have to be an image of Christ when, I was work, when I'm working. When they see me, they see Christ. 
I have to remember Christ in my, in, in my heart. I remember also one of the priests like teach me. I have to pray Jesus Christ prayed on my hand all the time. I have to remember. That's why this is easy. It's not about a specific time I have to pray. In the morning, and that's it. This is my homework. My father of confession said I have to pray in the morning. Okay, I'm going to pray one psalm, two psalms, so that's it. No. I have to pray all the day, but I have to remember this. It's easy. Sometimes it's so hard in the morning, for example, like I have to pray all the first hour. So what I should do is I have to divide sometimes the psalms to pray. I can't get myself to confess a specific sin. What you recommend? Well, first of all, if you if you are confessing regularly, so it's not going to be a problem because you know your father of confession, and you are used to tell your father of confession what's inside your heart. But if you are not confessing regularly, allow yourself to know your father of confession, and we say all the time. Father of confession, because it's a father. It's the image of Christ. And when you go to confess, you open your heart to God through yes, Abuna, to get the guide from God through Abuna. Your father of confession is not there to judge you or to look at you in, in a bad way or would be surprised that you commit that sin. But seeing the beauty of repentance inside your heart, instead of what you think, that is seeing your bad sin or ugly image, it's not that. When you go to confess, even the very worst sin or very bad sin that you commit, He's seeing the beauty that you come to God to get closer to Him and to you, you want to repent. That's the, the main goal. So He will never look at you in a different way, but He's seeing what you want to do exactly. So allow yourself sometimes to know your father of confession and uh, maybe eventually um, you can confess that sin. And as soon as you confess that, you know, that particular sin that you don't, you don't feel that you want to tell Abuna about it, you feel that you left a huge load away from your heart. But if you keep it inside your heart, you like living with that huge load all the time. You feel that pain all the time. And as soon as you tell Abuna, you're going to feel that, that relief away from your heart. Okay, now I want to add to Messy. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, you always really pick the best questions. I don't know. I'm going to conveniently skip this one and read the next one. My father's confession is not available as often as I would like him to be for my confessions. I'd like to confess more frequently. What should I do? Uh, well, I think just uh, have an honest uh, conversation with your father's confession and tell him your um, desire and your struggle that it, it's uh, too long and maybe he'll be able to accommodate some kind of arrangement with you and uh, otherwise he himself will tell you you know, some priests haram, they're alone in a, in a church that has a really large congregation. And so maybe if that doesn't work, he'll advise you to uh, try to speak with another father. They could also sin less, according to Father Joseph. Just <laughs> sin less. <laughs> sin less. <laughs> oh, sorry. Good advice. How can, I, we, how can we go back to praying and reading the Bible after we lived a long time without doing so and have trouble committing to it? Well, start small. There's no problem. God wants your heart. So start small, but maybe 
to help you be disciplined, let uh, sit with Abuna, your father, your father confessor, and decide how much you will read, how much you will pray uh, for the coming period, and maybe have regular, more frequent sitting with Abuna, so that he will follow up and, and boosting your aim, have a spiritual boost. So, but there's no, there's, the formula is that you give your heart, that you grow in the love of God. So uh, there's no, so start small with the uh, guidance of Abuna. Any other software questions? How are we sure there's life after death? Uh, uh, the Bible says there's life after death. And then we have many apparitions of saints, people who have died after. So, for example, in 1968 and in, in 69, on top of Zaytun, we have the Church of uh, St. Mary in Zaytun, Egypt. She appeared for like almost two years. Millions of people saw her. People took pictures of her. And that's 2,000 years after she died. It's a pretty good argument for life after death. Um, yeah. How can I be how can I become emotionally ready to be in a relationship? How can I become close? How can I become close to be filled with God's love? Um, recognizing God's love for us and realizing that He fills all of our needs, but God get, has given us the opportunity the choice to be able to be in a relationship with someone of the opposite gender so that we would be able to know someone in a deep and an intimate way because God is the complete and absolute other. He is agios. He is not of this world. Mm -hmm. We are of this world. So the word agios literally means not of the earth. Geo is like geology and A is a negation. So when we have marriage in mind, we keep in mind that the purpose of marriage is for us to grow in our relationship with God. As with all the sacraments, as with all of this life. So if I want to be emotionally mature, then I'm offering even these things to God. I'm saying, sanctify them. Teach, teach me, O oh Lord, how to uh, be joyful in a proper way or in a sorrowful way. When St. Gregory the theologian talks about St. Athanasius the Apostolic, he says that he was calm in his rebuke. Even if he was rebuking, he was doing so in calmness. And if he saw someone excessively joyful, he would be able to make him be balanced in his joy. So I ask God for this grace when I realize that I'm getting really joyful about um, something that's earthly and temporal. I can still be joyful, but I say, I say, God, this is in your hands. If I'm very sorrowful about something temporal that is not present with me, then I say, God, teach me to know that you are my joy. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation so that I don't have to look for the temporal joys that are here. How do we know if it's the Holy Spirit speaking to us and not the devil? God's Holy Spirit is known by experiencing, by living with him. I was just telling one of you that was asking the question on the side. How do we know, all of you know, if your brother or your sister coughs or sneezes, right? How do you know their sneeze or their cough from anyone else's? You spent time with them. You develop your relationship with them. You've seen them in all different types of circumstances. Not only do you know their cough or their sneeze, but you know their opinion in certain matters, something that would anger them, something that would push their buttons, something that would make them rejoice. So the more that we spend time with God, we're put in the frequency of God. We're in the means or the circle of grace by praying regularly, by reading the scriptures who were inspired, which were inspired by God's Holy Spirit, by entering into the church and praying the hymns that were inspired by God's Holy Spirit throughout the centuries. Then we know it's the, it's the Holy Spirit speaking to us. We don't, we, knowing, knowing the devil and his voice, we, when someone wants to know if someone's going to study diamonds or someone's going to be a diamond teller um, or someone that's selling diamonds, they study the actual good and holy, di good and pure diamond. They don't study all the different types of fake diamonds. So I need to know the, the words of God and I need to know God in truth. And then anything else, I will know it's not him. I will be waiting for his voice and I won't have to be searching for all the different schemes of the devil. That's why there was a question. I know it was removed, 
but there was a question about different forms of sexuality, even within the intimacy of marriage. And I know that these questions run through your heads. So we should know that there is something that we receive, that there's a holiness to marriage. Again, it's not just because something would be a sin or not a sin, but our body is given to us and it's a holy body. Again, this same body that we are living in now will be resurrected. So anything that we do to it, the impurities, we can already be living in that kingdom from keeping ourselves pure and holy now and remembering the presence of God. I was only saying that uh, I, about the same question. I think it was Amba Yusuf who uh, thought that uh, to recognize when you get a, uh, an opinion in your head, uh, an idea of something right or wrong or something about you, you did this wrong or you're, you're good. So I, I remember, I think it was Amba Yusuf, he said, the devil generalizes it, always generalize. So you're the best or you're a failure. So he generalizes that he puts you down, he, he tries to kill your momentum, he tries to off you up that you fall in pride. This is, so he always generalizes. You're, all, you're always doing this wrong. You're all, always generalizing. But the Holy Spirit is specific. He tells you, you have did wrong in this specific thing, so you can repent from it. Or you've done good. This thing, you've done good, and God, you know, this, this is just something I remember, and it's really beneficial. Can you please explain this verse, 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35, that says that women shouldn't speak in the churches? So first rule of thumb, don't ever take a single verse outside of its context. So what I encourage you to do is whenever you're reading these passages, don't only read the first couple of verses before it or after it, read the entire book. Read 1 Corinthians, and you're going to understand that St. Paul is writing to a group of people that in their church, they're facing a tremendous amount of chaos. There is absolute turmoil in the church of Corinth. There's a context that has to be understood. Corinth is currently dealing with a situation where there are pagan sects around them that specifically have a goddess that they worship. I'm tempted to say Diana, but I'm not sure, so don't quote me on that. But there is a pagan goddess that is being worshipped in Corinth that has priestesses and that preaches the idea that Adam uh -huh. was actually a secondary being to Eve. Uh -huh. And they're basically rejecting all of the Judaic culture and tradition that was handed down through scripture. So they are anti Jew. Now you can imagine when churches are praying, the only person who is technically allowed to speak in church is who? The priest or the bishop who is presiding. There were situations where Paul was dealing with the church of Corinth telling him these women, these priestesses from these pagan temples are entering into the church and literally sabotaging the services, taking over and teaching and preaching over the men because this was an acceptable culture in the reality. If you want proof of the fact that St. Paul is not anti-woman, if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he actually talks about how it is that it is normal for women to both pray and to prophesy. It is entirely normal. This is the same St. Paul who later on when talking about marriage in the book of Ephesians, talks about how it is that submission is not only from the wife, but that we ought to submit to one another in love. So whenever we are tempted to take a verse outside of its context, Please remember that the church is always teaching us exactly like Sayyidina was showing us in the, the, the first lecture that we received that was filled with so much insight as to what every single heresy or false piece of information that we believe is because we're nitpicking and taking scripture outside of its context. So if you want to know what a passage or a verse or a book in the Bible actually means, go back to those who received from the authors themselves. Go back to the early church and you'll see all of this context and all of this history is very clearly described by those who receive the faith. If I'm going through a breakup, should I still keep in contact with my ex? <laughs> I never break up before. <laughs> so it depends on your friendship with this, your, your, your ex. For example, like for sure, if you you are a friend before and something happened and which is like this relationship is good, it's friendship. So you can talk with her or him. It's easy. But if there is problem and issues, for example, I think it's so hard to talk. Like maybe after a while, we're going to talk later. 
because you're gonna if you are still in the same, same church, for example, and you see each other, so you're gonna talk together. So it depends on this relationship. What's a good duration, minimum, maximum between engagement and marriage? Not too long, not too short. <laughs> Make it easy. But uh, the goal here, if you, this period of time, it's not to let grow the emotion between you and your partner, but to know each other. So the main goal here, to know each other and uh, the characteristic of each one. So this is the main goal. Try to focus on that and try to see, are you going to be able to live with this girl? Are you going to be able to live with that boy for your life? That's a big question. So prayer, 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 and also know each other well, not following your emotions. And you're going to see that the duration is going to be uh, acceptable or reasonable. Uh, there's a question here that says, what sets Christianity apart? The answer is simple, Jesus. That's it. I, I, spent, I spent two years in university searching, like, like very deeply searching uh, in great existential angst to know what's the truth. I read, I studied, I asked a million questions. Uh, I, I, I studied Sanskrit so I can translate the Bhagavad Gita, which is the Hindu text. I studied Arabic for the Quran. I studied, uh, you know, you name it, religions, philosophies, um, occult, atheism. And in the end, the summary is this. There is no one like Jesus. And there's no one that comes anywhere near to the Lord Jesus Christ. No, no person before or after. No one, no one, nothing. No one sets free, no one heals, no one is still alive like him. There's, n there's no one like Jesus. Taoism is really cool, but there's no one like Jesus, just from a philosophical perspective. Uh, uh, and I think he was talking about Jesus without knowing it, but that's a whole other story. Uh, the second question that is connected to that is why can't we marry people from other religions? Because if they don't have Jesus, they don't have life. Simple. There's, it really is that simple. There is no one like Jesus. How to conquer habitual sins? Is it about habits, Yanni? Uh, I was thinking the best way is to uh, be filled with Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is to um, allow God's grace to work in you because we are more than conquerors in Christ. So alone we cannot be victorious, but with Christ. And to have Christ, we need to be in his presence. We need to be filled with him, the means of grace. And another thing is if you have a bad habit or you have a bad vice, practice the opposite. Just practice the opposite. If you love to spend money on yourself, you go shopping a lot, start spending money on others. Mm. This would automatically yeah. heal yeah. or remedy the, the, the shopping uh, addiction. Uh, so try to, to, to practice the virtue opposite of the, the vice. But bad habits, it's, it can only be uh, conquered or, or, or uh, through Christ and his presence in your life. So the more we have Christ, automatically you will be, you will be protected. You will be strong in him. Why do we still keep the Coptic language and liturgy when most of the congregation does not understand it nowadays? Number one is because um, the Coptic language is, is the way that we receive the liturgy, meaning the original language that the liturgy and 
our prayers, all, when I say liturgy, I don't mean just the liturgy that we pray on Sunday for the Eucharist, for the partaking of the body and blood, but our baptismal prayers, our psalmody, all of it was received in the, in the Coptic language. And so there's a need for us to continue to use it until we can perfect, as you all know, like when I come here in Canada, I'm sure that the way that you even say and the words that are translated, how you're, how you're saying the responses are going to be a bit different. If I say, if I pray the Tazbaha with you, maybe the, if you don't use Coptic reader, but there's many churches throughout the world that are still not using a certain standard. So um, we still need to perfect this. So, so the use of Coptic is still warranted in our time. But I will make sure to add this. We need to be praying in the vernacular language, meaning we need to be praying in the language of a land. Here you have um, English and and I think you have French in some areas. Um, and there's also the matter of people immigrating from Egypt. And we need to create a path by which they can assimilate so they can pray in Arabic for a period of time so that they don't lose their, their zeal in their life with God and, and being able to pray the liturgy. But at the same time, they're being able, they're, they're, a path is being made for them to assimilate, to pray in the vernacular language in English because this is where uh, they came to the land that, that prays either in English or speaks in English. Uh, or in French in this case. Um, so this doesn't mean that we take away that. There's also another question on why does the church not have a standard and unified answer to some theological questions? Example, original sin, theosis, salvation. We learn from our fathers um, that there are two, um, two different matters. There's matters of dogma and there's matters of theology. And these terms are used uh, loosely. You can, you can label it however you want to, but this is how one of our fathers puts it, that dogma is the things that we receive that are essential for our salvation to understand. So, for example, concerning original sin, Adam did not follow the commandment of God. He disobeyed the commandment of God. If someone were to say that doesn't have an impact on human beings, that would be heresy. That would be wrong. They cannot say that. But we all agree that it has an impact on human beings. How it has that impact and to what degree there are certain nuances to this that we did not receive in a very clear way from the fathers. There's a difference between something that is necessary for our salvation that was discussed throughout the centuries and is received very clearly in the writings of the fathers versus we're trying to dig into the fathers and find something that pertains to issues that are going on now in our church, right? The fathers talked about us being united with God and being partakers of the divine nature. But the depth of this is talked about in a spiritual way. Our fathers desired to experience this, not to define it as much as to experience it. So there are certain limits to our knowledge of the spiritual matters and even the theological matters that it, we, we want to be able to differentiate. And this is what's happening in the church now. It's not that there's division in the church, but rather there is a struggle to be able to see what is it that needs to be believed versus there's other things that there's options that some fathers believe this and other fathers believe this. And they didn't find a problem with this. So, um, for example, in, in North America, so you all are aware, um, and some of the fathers here participated, we have something called a theological dialogue. So different representatives from the different dioceses throughout North America um, are appointed, different clergy members, priests and deacons, are appointed to represent or to come and participate, not to represent, but to come and participate in the dialogue. And certain papers are presented on different topics. And then from there, we are able to discuss the nuances of original sin, of theosis, of salvation. Uh, and the purpose of it is to be able to try to differentiate and say, these are the things that are necessary for us to be on the path of salvation that we have received very clearly from the fathers. And as we mentioned, for example, the creed I was talking about in my talk, we, we, we believe in one God all the way until the end. We look for the resurrection of the dead and life, the age to come. These are essential principles that the church has taught us. Some of the things that we're discussing in our modern time were not very clearly discussed. We have to dig deeper into the fathers to be able to find them, which means that they weren't focused on these topics. So we're praying that after such dialogues, we'd be able to come up with more of, a, of uh, an understanding that these, these types of opinions that are maybe uh, around uh, in different groups are acceptable, but it's not necessary for us to believe this. And these other opinions are acceptable, but it's not necessary for you to believe this or to be able to say, this is not appropriate. We cannot believe this about this particular topic. And this is not appropriate. We cannot believe this.
How to not feel pressured and not to compare our situation to other people. I feel like I'm late compared to where I should be, and I compare myself to others. This whole idea of you thinking that you're not where you should be is a double-edged sword. you got to understand that the Holy Spirit is there to be able to convict you and let you know that sometimes, yes, the Holy Spirit is telling you and me, shit the hell. Like, you're running behind. There is so much more potential there, and that God wants you to be able to inherit something that is significantly better than what you've chosen for yourself. But there are other times where that same exact idea is also used by the devil. And his entire purpose is to be able to fill you with hopelessness and despair so that you can give up and say, there is no chance for me to be able to satisfy God or to speak in a way as if somehow there is nothing I can do to possibly make God love me. And this is where the devil is very good at being able to trick us into falling into these levels of despair and hopelessness and thinking that there is no, there is, that we are not lovable, that we are not accepted by God. So when we fall into this trap of comparison, Habibi, the only person you're expected to compare yourself to is you, but yesterday. That is the only person you're expected to compare yourself to. If you are not getting better, even at the smallest level, when it comes to who you were yesterday, then this should be the only measurement that you look at. Don't look at your neighbor. Forgive me, but when you take a look at even some of the saints that we have in the church, some of them have lived lives where they've lived an ascetic offering like St. Anthony the Great for 85 years. 85 years almost. He lives an ascetic life completely consecrated to Christ, wanting to be able to offer the church and all of Christianity one of the greatest gifts with it, which is monasticism and asceticism and the entire model of what it looks like to be a monk. There are other saints who in the middle of the night, on the same day that they repented, they are taken instantaneously. Do you remember the parable of the stewards that were paid at the 11th hour? How those who came in the beginning were told, if you work your full day, I want to give you a denarius and that will be your wage. But then the master sends out and says, find anybody else in the streets. And those who come in last minute are also paid the full wage. Now, I'm not saying this so that you guys can say, oh, I got time. That's not what I'm saying. Because there's sometimes this model that exists in the mind of many people where they say, you know who's my hero? The righteous thief, the right hand thief. Why? And that's it. <laughs> That's, that's garbage, of course. Please don't believe that lie. Please don't believe that lie. At least he had the privilege of knowing he was about to die on the cross. You and I, we have no idea. I believe it's St. Augustine. It's either St. Augustine or Pope Shenouda. I'm not sure <laughs> which one said it. Who talked about how it is that the Lord does not promise tomorrow for your, for your procrastination. He only promises today for your repentance. If you have the opportunity today, to be able to think about what it is that you want to offer God, then offer what you can today. Don't worry about what it is that your neighbor is doing. The only people you should compare yourself to is when you look at the disciples and the apostles of Christ who were completely unworthy of the calling to follow Him. Completely unworthy. When you take a look at all of the saints who preceded us, who nothing they can do would render them worthy of the grace of holiness that was given to them. Nothing they can do. How about you forgive me for even saying this, but when you take a look at some of our greatest saints, the holiest men and women, the church does not say that one of them, one of them was deserving of the kingdom. We don't use that language. It's not about being worthy or deserving. It's recognizing that everything he gives us is grace. Everything he gives us is gifted. Everything he gives us is based on his mercy and his love for us. So receive his love, receive his mercy, and do better. But don't compare yourself to anyone else. Focus strictly on offering what you can today. Any tips on choosing a godly girl for a marriage? I don't know all the questions come to me, engagement, <laughs> like marriage. <laughs> godly girl. Any tips? I can read from Proverbs. Proverbs uh, chapter 31, verse 10. So, who can find a virtuous wife? It's a question. For her worth is far above yours. You're going to do a lot of things. Depend on what you're choosing. In the same chapter, God answered this question in verse number 30. He said, Charm is deceitful, 
and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So it's dependent on exactly what you are searching for. I have a friend, so he's older than me. And he's always asking me like to find a girl for him. I don't know how. So every time she's like, oh, he's here, she, she's very good. So he said, oh, uh, you know what? She's, um, she's not beautiful. I, I, I love more like if she's white. So I said, okay, really? This is what you are searching for. If your heart is really looking for the beauty, as exactly the verse in, in, uh, we said, so you will not find anything. It depends on what you're searching for. First of all, I have to pray. I have to put this subject on the altar or the time. I have to pray. The second, I have to find, to, to see the girl from inside. She fears God. This is very important. The problem again, that we are looking to the beauty only from outside. This is very superficial. There is a lot of tips I have to, to give it to you. It's only one thing. Pray and look to the heart of the girl. Or again, for the girl, look to the heart of the boy. This is very important only. And to choose every day in your prayers, ask God, give me the right person from your hand and open my eyes and my heart to see the right person. And that's it. And the Holy Spirit that we talked before about, He's going to guide you to. How not to feel burnt out in service? First, I need to ask myself why I'm serving. Service should be, comes out of love to God. And that you feel that God is doing a lot for you during all your life. And you're offering something a little uh, to him. But in a practical way, also be uh, faithful with your father confession and not to serve so many, doing many things. And then that may, at the same time, uh, it's better to focus on a few things and doing that, uh, doing your best, doing that service. And as I told you, out of love, not as a duty. If you feel that you're doing the service because of the service, or because you have to do this, so you are losing the grace of uh, the service itself. I can just add to that because uh, there's a sermon uh, by Amba Yusuf on SoundCloud called How to Not Feel Burnt Out in the Service. Happens to be exactly the question. What are the odds, you know? So, uh, Sayyidina mentions all the points that Abuna just uh, mentioned is that, like, the source, of course, should be that uh, we are expressing our love for God and all these things. But he also mentioned an additional point that I had never thought about before. But he says that uh, you need to really not focus on the results when you serve. Like, don't be stressed out if you have a, a class. For example, a class of kids and everything you're teaching them and they're doing the opposite and they're rebelling and they're not doing anything that what you're teaching them. He says, it's not really your job at all to worry about the results. The only measuring stick is, are you faithful in your service? You need to only worry about how faithful am I in my service? Uh, am I being faithful in my service? And that's it. That's it. Like leave all the rest to God. Even if you don't see any fruit at all or you don't see any benefit at all, this starts to make you feel bad. It makes you feel um, hopeless. And it makes like this is part of how we get burnt out in the service. And he just reminds us like that's not your business. It's not your role. Like just like um, Noah, for example, preached to people for many, many years telling them like there's going to be a flood and everyone ignored him. But he was faithful. He did his part. He warned everybody. He was faithful until the end. So he's a faithful servant, even though 
the ark was pretty empty in the end, except for the animals. Uh, Matthew 7, 22, 23 terrifies me all the time because why me, a regular Christian, would get to heaven if people who do miracles will not make it? Just for context, the passage says, not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom. Right? But in that day, they, he, he'll say to them, I don't know you, depart from me. And they say to him, but we cast out demons in your name and did many wonders in your name. He's like, I don't know you. Okay. So... So it's, it, the, the, there's, um, there's something very deep about this passage. It's very interesting to consider the person's response to Christ. His response is like, literally, like, do you know who my dad is? Do you know what I've done? Do you not know what I have done? Which is the total opposite response to the risk in, in Matthew 25. He says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was naked and you covered me. I'm like, when did we do that? Right? When did we do these things? Right? So that there's a, a massive difference between the pursuit of your own self-righteousness and the uh, conviction that you're all that and that you're something special versus those who have fed and clothed and visited without even thinking that they've done anything. So I think there's a, there's a real key here of humility and following the commandments without thinking about oneself versus, uh, and, and those people that fed and, and, and you know, visited and so on, they weren't doing miracles. It's not like they're miracle workers. They're very simple, normal Christians. Why is everybody laughing? What? Who's running the Who's running the Slido on the screen from the servants? So we have way too many immature people in the crowd. Turn it off, please. Everybody can follow on their phones. And for those of you who are behaving this way, forget forget any shame on you. What are we doing? You have a panel of clergymen who are trying to answer questions of people who actually care. And you guys are not taking it seriously. For those of you who have nothing better to do, turn off your phones, Habibi. I'd rather you fall asleep. Please turn off the Slido. How to deal with breakups? I'm praying a lot about it, but I feel like God is not hearing me. So you broke up with your fiancé or your relationship, whatever, and you can't move on. I'm, that's what I'm trying to understand. You can't move on after the breakup. First, consider the breakup, plus it's done, right? So consider the breakup is for your own good. Learn a lesson. It's like when you fail an exam, you have to move on. I'm going to repeat the exam again, or I'm going to move forward. I'm going to learn a lesson. I'm going to study more and move on. So I have to look forward. So consider that this is something good that happened. I feel that an exam is bad, but there's good that comes out of it, that I, I learned my lesson. Next time, I'm going to do better. So look ahead, look forward. Put it behind you and consider that it was something good for you. It was not meant to be. And God has a better plan for you. Um, what else? Uh, yeah. Are Mar Mari Emmanuel's <clears throat> beliefs like ours? No. Plain and simple, no. Um, he, in different videos, will... Um, I cannot claim to have watched all of his videos, but those that have been sent to me um, are enough to show that in some times he's agreeing with the theology of the church and other times he is not agreeing with the theology of the church. And he still ascribes to the fact that Nestorius, who we considered a heretic, is a saint and that St. Cyril is teaching that he is not a saint. So this in and of itself, it's not just a matter of calling someone a saint or not. It's about ascribing to their teaching or not. Um, even when we wanted to have 
a dialogue with the Eastern Orthodox, we decided that St. Cyril of Alexandria is so important to the history of Orthodoxy that he would be our common father that we're looking at to be able to see what he said and that we both accept him. So I would not recommend for anyone to be watching Marmari's videos um, because again, if we need to be grounded in the Orthodox Christian faith, the things that we know are true and good and holy, these things hold on to and continue in these things knowing from where you have learned them. So even if he's saying something good, I'm not denying the fact that any preacher, I would hope, would be saying good teaching at some point. But as one of our beloved fathers has taught us, the heretics, not everything the heretics said is heretical. Not everything the heretics said is heretical. So surely for people to believe them, they will have some good teaching and they will have some correct teaching. But there's no need for us to go to teachers that are outside of the church for us to be able to learn the true faith and to learn the ways of God. And that's what a lot of what I was talking about in the references that our church fathers themselves did not go to just anybody. They went to the fathers that were that they knew that they were trusted before them, um, and they went. They understood the consensus of the fathers. Um, can I take communion while I have my period? This is a matter of decision for the Holy Synod, because it is not a doctrinal matter. It is a matter of pastoral care, and there have been different. Um, ways the church has handled this throughout the centuries. But I will read you the statement so you're aware that in uh, June 2017, the, the Synod appointed a committee of bishops, um, all of which were in the medical field at different times. And they came out with this statement to let the females know that it is not a matter of defilement that is happening to them. And also for the males to know that nocturnal emissions that happen to males and do not happen to females, and that, that the menstrual cycle that happens to females and does not happen to males, according to what we are uh, accepting from the tradition of the church, it is not proper for communion to be received. That does not prevent, of course, if there is an extreme case in which there is excessive bleeding or regular bleeding, and this does not prevent the, the woman from getting an absolution from her father of confession to partake of communion. She's not getting absolution for sin. She's getting an absolution to do something different from what the church has ascribed. And this is a principle of our church. We are a synodical church. We don't believe in the infallibility of any human being. And so if the synod has gathered a group of bishops together to be able to appoint them to study this matter and they come up with a decision, then we respect it. Just like a parents in a home, not everything that our parents told us to do as rules in the household or something we liked or even something that was necessary. But they chose a way of life and a way of, of rearing us for that they saw was best for us. Our, our next door neighbors and our friends chose different ways and maybe they were raised as holy men and women as well. But this is an, an ordinance that the church has passed down. And that's why even in the, 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 the text of the decision, it says, due to godliness and proper care. It's saying first that the, the woman is, a, a, is, is pure and a temple of the Holy Spirit all the days of her life. Um, and that the only thing that defiles us is sin. However, due to the godliness and proper care or readiness in partaking of the holy mysteries and abiding by the tradition that has been handed down to us, it is fitting for a man or a woman to abstain from communion in periods of physical unpreparedness. So the church is looking at it as if someone is not abstaining from food. Like when someone eats something in the morning, then they're not physically prepared to partake of the Eucharist. Um, except in exceptional, exceptional cases for pastoral reasons, as decided by the priest who is the spiritual guide for the individual. Um, not even the angels in heaven or the son himself, only the father knows. I'll answer this portion of it. Um, this is a verse that's uh, found in uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 32. Um, and it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ saying that even the Son does not know the time of the second coming. There are two different, just like we were talking about when it came to the question of why is there not a unified response for certain matters in the church. So here we see that there's uh, two different um, interpretations. One is um, that the Lord Jesus Christ truly as God, he knows in his divinity, but that he doesn't know in his humanity, um, which is equal to our humanity. 
So therefore, he, he resembled us even in his ignorance. That's why in the Gospel of St. Luke, it said he grew little by little according to the form of men. And we repeat this in, in the fraction, he grew little by little according to the form of men, yet alone was without sin. So he even took our ignorance upon him. And St. Athanasius and St. Gregory the Theologian are of this opinion. They're, they're explaining this verse in this way. This is what we lean to. There's another opinion that's not wrong for us to mention, and it's not wrong according to the church teachings, that St. Augustine and St. Hilaire of Poitiers, they say that he knows the time of the second coming, but he didn't want to tell them about it. And it's compared to a teacher that knows the right answer to the question, but the student is asking them during the exam, can I, yani, tell, me the, tell me the answer to the question. And he's not telling them the answer to the question because it's not appropriate for them to know at that time. He says no. How can I overcome the desire to be in a relationship? So I'm going to assume that this is a person who is capable of being in a relationship in the future, but they just don't want to do it now at a time where they might not be ready. Um, because to be clear, it's okay for you to desire to be in a relationship just at the right time and in the right place, and as long as you find the right person. Um, how do you overcome this desire has a lot to do with why it is that you want to be in a relationship to begin with. There's a lot of people who want to be in a relationship just because you feel like everybody else around you at this age is in a relationship. There's other people who think that if I get into a relationship immediately, I'm no longer going to be lonely. I have to tell you, this is a huge lie. There are many people who are in relationships who are still very much lonely because there's no real connection. Especially at your age where relationships don't mean much at all. Forgive me, but think back to just a little while ago, a few years ago, when most of you were in high school. Think back to the beginning of the year in September. The popular guy or the popular girl at school, who were they dating? Now think to just halfway through the year, right before Christmas break, were they still dating the same person? Now think to when you came back from the Christmas break, were they still dating the same person? Now get all the way to June, were they still with the same person? Relationships are literally, unfortunately, today in modern day society, relationships are nothing more than pairs of shoes that you put on and throw away and you try to match your outfit with it. And that's the end of it. And it's really unfortunate, but that's what it's become. If you are sincerely looking within yourself and trying to identify what is it that is lacking that I think a relationship will give me, you will ultimately come to the conclusion that the only thing that really satisfies the human soul is Christ. So I'm going to urge you to remember what it is that we pray in the litany of the gospel. The church teaches you and me constantly that Christ is what? He is the life of us all, the salvation of us all, the hope of us all, the healing of us all, the resurrection of us all. He is our everything. And if you are at an age where you're still not ready to be able to commit or to give yourself over to be in a relationship where you will be responsible to offer your life to another, then this is the period where you are preparing yourself to be a suitable partner in a relationship in the future. Many of us make the mistake of thinking that when it's time to be in a relationship, we have to go out there and shop around. This is the age where the, all of you are supposed to be focusing on making sure that you have something to offer. Not to go shopping around as if you want to take something from someone else. If you have nothing offered to the relationship, why would someone choose you? So think about it in this way. Right now, this is the time for you to choose Christ, to allow him to be your everything, so that you have something to offer when the opportunity presents itself. So that in that relationship, you also are a person who is worthy of the other. Is occasional casino. <laughs> That's what I should answer. <laughs> Not on Wednesdays and Fridays. That's <laughs> <laughs> speechless. Yeah, yeah speechless. <laughs> like, like exactly. Like, can I do a sim, for example? Like <laughs> once, for example, you know, can I do a sim? It's occasional sim. Can I do sim for, for? Please give me a solution to go to the casino, for example. Like to do to do anything, and after that, you're gonna give me an absolution. I'm gonna come back to you, and again, I'm, I'm gonna pray for you the absolution. No, totally no. Something wrong. It's not occasional to do. <laughs> it's not allowed to do. Where is your heart? That's why this Abuna exactly, where are your heart? So I have to, I have to decide which is wrong, which is right. And I have to follow the, step, the steps of Christ. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, it says uh, how to know if your partner is the right one for you. If even did we answer this or it's a new one? No. We did. Okay. How can we learn to be patient and to wait for God's perfect timing in all things? Well, I, I guess I want to say that um, a lot of times, like I think, because we we grow up in the culture of having milestones, like you know, you you go through primary school to finish, so that you can get to high school, and then you finish that, so you can go to sejep or university, and then you do that so that you can get a job, and you do that so you, that you can uh, be able to, you know have a relationship and be married and you know the the milestones and the bella culture uh like we're, we're we're always like looking to the next thing and i've personally made the mistake many times in my life where i'm in a certain life phase and i'm not enjoying it because i'm only like waiting to get to the next phase you know and then once i'm in the next phase i look back and i say oh those were really good days that you know there, we, we had a really nice time when we were younger. Like we complain when we're in college and we can't wait to be done and we can't, we hate studying. But when it's done and we're working every day and it's a routine, then we're like, oh, I miss those college days when we were, you know, out with friends and all that. So what I want to say is that I think it's nice to try to see every stage of our life as being like uh, um, a blessing from God and trying to learn everything it is that he wants to teach us in that life phase to enjoy the present moment. I don't know, like C.S. Lewis spoke a lot about how the presence or the present moment is like how it touches eternity. Like in eternity, you know, in eternity we'll not be thinking about the past and having regrets because it's all gone long time ago. And we're not going to be worried about the future. We're only going to be enjoying the present moment. So he says, when you're able in your life to enjoy the present moment, then in a sense you're touching eternity or you're living like a piece of eternity. So I think it's just a nice practice to, in order to be patient and to wait for God's perfect timing in all things is to say to ourselves, like, I'm not just in a waiting room for the next phase, but there is something to be enjoyed in the blessing of this phase that I'm in now. Go charge your phone. <laughs> How to deal with a vaping friend who can't stop even when we force them to. Let me ask you a question. If you were the one with the problem, how would you want your friends to deal with you? We all have our sins, we all are, have, our, have our bad habits. So what would you think? What would you do? What would you want? How do you want people to support you? Think about this answer, and this will give you the answer to the question that you ask. So if you want people to pray for you, to encourage you, well, do the same. We all need support. We all need to be patient with others because we want others to be patient with us as well. And put it in God's hands. Sometimes uh, there's, uh, when the ears can't, when people can't listen, speak to god about it sometimes we want to speak to people about god about good things and how to be good right so when you can't speak you're not able to speak with them about god speak to god about them that's prayer yeah. i found the one one that i want to answer abuna that's me tell us why cannabis is bad for us let me tell you why cannabis is bad for you The Lord, every time or very often when he's speaking about prayer, what does he say to us? Before he says pray, what does he say? Watch. Watch and pray. What does St. Peter say? He says, be sober, be vigilant. Be sober, be vigilant. What does St. Paul say? He says, do not be drunk with wine in which there is much dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
So what's the issue with cannabis? What's the issue with drunkenness? What's the issue with the harder drugs or the softer drugs? What's the issue? The issue is you are not sober, you're not awake, you are not watchful, and you are unable to pray. It's a state of being chill or relaxed or whatever it is that is the opposite of being watchful. And the reason why we have to be watchful is, St. Peter says very clearly, for your enemy the the devil is roaming around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. So the issue with it is that we are completely uh, not ready or able to properly pray when we're when we're uh, uh, using cannabis. That's the first thing. Secondly, St. Paul says, but rather be filled with the Spirit. See, the issue is, the issue is that we're using something counterfeit when we have the real, the real thing, right? Why use Monopoly money when you have real money? You, you only use Monopoly money when you're playing a game. It's not real. And so whatever you're looking for, in drugs and alcohol and all these things, it is all counterfeit. That's why St. Paul tells us to pursue and to seek the Holy Spirit. And and being filled with the Spirit is where real peace, real joy, real life happens. It's not in all these other pseudo uh, 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 drugs that that are there to, to make us feel whatever. That's why cannabis is an issue. Why does the Coptic Church not officially recognize the Book of Enoch? It's simple. According to the principles that we were learning about together, it was never included in any of the canons throughout the history. The Church Fathers didn't recognize it. And even if there were some groups that recognized it at different times, there's no consensus that it was a book inspired by God's Holy Spirit. And so it's not recognized. Even when it's referred to in the Book of Jude, it doesn't necessarily mean just because it's referred to that it is a canonical book. They can be referring to any other book um, or any philosopher as the church fathers read philosophy and maybe they read the book of Enoch, but that doesn't mean it's inspired scriptures, just like we have the Didache and the Shepherd of Hermes and uh, many of the early apostolic writings. Um, because for, for time's sake, we're ending, but there was a question about um, when you were younger, becoming before becoming a monk or a priest, how did you grow old? Uh, closer to God and discover that this was your calling. I think it's really important that whenever um, you as college or university students and you're you're going into the stage of life where you're going to have permanency, meaning your, your life is not going to constantly be changing as from one grade to another and then you're going to be going from one profession to another. You're finding permanency whether the questions about, and that, hence all the questions about like marriage and relationships, which is healthy for you to be asking at this time, um, or questions about the will of God or knowing uh, the will of God in our lives. But the most important thing in all of these matters is that we realize, and we should, we should have realized this by now, but if we have not, don't lose hope. You are here and God is speaking to you through conventions like this and through your spiritual fathers and through listening to the scriptures or reading the scriptures And when you're praying, stop and spend time in quietness before God to hear his voice. But in the end, we need to know that our lives are God. Our lives are with God. They are God's. They are not ours to live. So we should come to the decision that I realize God's love for me. And therefore, whatever I do, if I get married, if I consecrate myself, if I go to the monastery or the convent, if I have children or I don't have children, if I serve in one capacity or another capacity, if I live in this place or that place, if I live with this profession or the other profession, whatever it is, but my life is to glorify God. It's like I'm writing a check and the check is, the, the amount of the check is my life. And where I'm writing it to, I'm just offering it to God and saying, God, I know my life is yours. Teach me where you want me to write this check to. You want me to write it to evangelism and serving the poor Okay, you want me to go to the monastery and consecrate my life to a life of prayer? Okay, 
You want me to live a holy life and, and live with a spouse, a husband or a wife and, and have godly children and, and, and raise them in the fear of you? You want me to serve in the church? Maybe you're going to call me at one point to the priesthood or to be a consecrated sister or a consecrated deacon. But in the end, I realize, and this needs to happen now, not after you get married. It's very difficult to do that after you get married. Much, much more difficult than now. So offer to God whatever faith, whatever zeal, whatever love you have. And remember that God takes five loaves and two fish that we think are completely insignificant. Mm -hmm. And he feeds over 15,000 men and women. He's able to do that. So don't belittle your zeal. Or even if you're asking this question, you have a zeal and you have a desire. Just the fact that you're asking the question, offer that to God. Stand before him and tell him regularly. My Lord Jesus Christ, I desire to live with you. I want a life with you. Show me the life with you. I don't want to ever leave you. Regardless of where you lead me to, I will be with you. I trust that you're going to be with you. Whether all of these different ways of life that we said, they all have their struggles. They all have their temptations. And so we want that peace of God when he's guiding us so that when the temptations come, I know that he is with me. Because it's not about not going through difficulties. We're not trying to avoid difficulties. But we know that there's difficulties. And the Lord said in the world there will be tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. If we're serving God and we're, we're truly receiving his love and sharing his love with others, we will experience tribulation and difficulty in this life. But God, as long as he is with us, he will grant us that peace that is above understanding. Um, certainly, there's a lot of questions we didn't answer. I don't know if there's other time you know, for questions and answers in the convention or not, but even not. Remember that you can ask you know, your spiritual fathers. You have servants and spiritual fathers. You have questions, ask. And I know that there's programs and times, not just in the retreats, but some of your spiritual meetings, you have open question and answers. So um, ask the questions, but again, be willing to receive the response and live according to the response. If you're really looking for the answers truly, then um, be willing to, to, uh, to live according to the response that you receive from God and from the church. There's some questions even that asked about our opinions concerning certain things. It's not about our opinions, beloved. We try as best as we can to deliver to you what we have received. And maybe that's the whole summary of the first talk is that we don't want to deliver to you something of our own self because then that puts us in the form of judgment. We're judging. We're, we're, we're in front of God. We'll, we will be judged for that. But we rather we want to deliver to you what we have received from our fathers in the church, both in history and now. So our God be the glory.